what is I.O.? So, um, I've got 10 minutes to explain it to you, but I want to start by telling you a story about high jumping. Um, in 1912, just over 100 years ago, the world high jump record for men was two metres. That means you would have cleared Michael Jordan if you'd done that. That's pretty remarkable, right? How could you top two metres in the high jump? Um, 1912. Remarkably, over the next 50 years, by 1962, the world's high jumpers had increased the men's world record to 2.27 metres. That's a foot. 50 years. You know, clearing Michael Jordan to going a foot higher in 50 years is pretty remarkable as far as I'm concerned. How did they do it? They did it through a series of um, advances in science, sports science, technology, training, um, nutrition. They did it through a variety of means, and they achieved that remarkable thing of increasing it by a foot. Okay? By 1962, to stick with the NBA theme, um, seven and a half feet, that's the height of Yao Ming. He was one of the highest NBA players in history, one of the tallest men in history. Seven and a half feet to clear him is pretty unbelievable. I don't know how they do it. So that was 1962. Fast forward to 1968 in Mexico City at the Olympics. The world's eyes were on the Olympics and everything that was going on and the athletics. People didn't really expect much from the high jump. Um, seven and a half feet was pretty remarkable. It was pretty insurpassable as far as most people were concerned. So people weren't really expecting much. Um, if anyone was going to break seven and a half feet, it was going to be someone of incredible training. Someone who um, had, since being a fetus, been trained to high jump, been trained to jump higher than anyone else. It wasn't this chap, Dick Fosbury, who was a scrawny guy from Oregon in the US. Um, now, he was once described as the world's most hopeless high jumper, having a technique like an airborne seizure. Um, he once lost a bet with his friend that he could jump over his chair and break his hand. Um, he missed the opening ceremony of the Olympics. He wasn't there because he was stuck in the back of a taxi on the way back from sightseeing at the pyramids. But what he did do was he found, he stumbled upon really, um, a technique that was better than anything the world had seen. Um, it was so good that that year at the Olympics in 68, he blew away the competition and he won Olympic gold. Um, now everyone thought he was crazy. Um, he was going over the bar backwards um, and no one had ever done that before. But it did work um, and he won Olympic gold. Um, and people weren't very happy about this. You know, the establishment was a bit bemused. They didn't really accept what he was doing at first. Even though he'd won Olympic gold, they didn't really think that what he was doing was right. They didn't think it fitted with the programme. Because after all, they were embarrassed. Um, you know, no one likes to be forced to um, change their policy or what they think about things, do they, Nick? Um, but once ridiculed, Fosbury became an inspiration. And now everybody uses the Fosbury flop in high jumping. Now, that story of a kind of 100 years of advancement in high jumping has got a lot of synergies with oncology. And the last 100 years that we've seen the massive developments that we have in the area. It's 1912, back to that two meter uh, men's record that I talked about at the beginning. And um, we had two ways of treating cancer. We had surgery. Um, we'd had safe anaesthetics for a while. People were doing the first cancer operations. And we had radiotherapy. Um, Marie Curie discovered radium at the turn of the century. People were experimenting with that. In the 40s came chemotherapy, um, which ironically was developed from mustard gas used in the First World War. Um, and these three tools formed the toolbox that doctors would have for the next 100 years or so in treating cancer. Um, and they were remarkably effective. Um, and they were so effective um, that we've now improved the outcomes in a lot of cancers to a remarkable extent. Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, 1960, um, type of um, leukaemia um, that's uh, more common in children, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, ALL. In 1960, it was incurable. Um, you know, practically zero you know, percent cure rate. Incredibly, today, 90% of children who get ALL will be cured not just treated, but cured. It will never come back. That's, and that's remarkable, and that's kind of testament to our ability and what we've done in terms of developing these three tools, this toolbox over the last 100 years or so. Okay. So surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, you can cut it out. Okay. You can burn it with radiotherapy, or you can poison it with chemotherapy. 
And these three tools have been remarkably good in improving outcomes in cancer. Okay. They've got us to, in ALL as an example in children, 90% cure rate, which is incredible. Okay. Um, the thing that unites these three tools and the paradigm of cancer treatment, if you like, that's taught to all doctors is that what they all boil down to is fundamentally um, addressing the common enemy in cancer, which is the immune system. Um, the cancer and the immune system are very good friends. They get on very well. And when one of them goes out of control, the other one does. They follow each other. A bit like lemmings, I suppose. They follow each other. Um, and what doctors are taught is that the immune system is something to be feared, it's something to be suppressed, it's something to be trampled on, it's something to be kept on a very tight lead if it, as if it was a dog. You know, you have to keep it very, very safe, you have to keep it very close to you. If you let it go out of control, then bad things happen. Um, but it turns out that that's actually not true. You know? Um, if you take the rain off the immune system, actually, wonderful things can happen. Um, and we, you don't end up like good old Fenton there you know, running across Richmond Park and causing a car crash. Actually, wonderful things can happen in cancer treatment. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of that. I talked about ALL in kids earlier. Um, and while the cure rate up front, in the majority of cases, is excellent, 90% survival. The cure rate for, and the kind of survival rate in children who don't um, get that response is unfortunately not as good. 20% um, five-year survival, okay? In those 10%, they don't get cured, um, which, is, which is very sad. Um, now, that's with our traditional toolbox of those three tools, cut, poison, or burn, 20% five-year survival. What would happen if you took the new approach, if you dared to take the reins off the immune system a little? What do you think? 20% five-year survival, double it, triple it. You can almost quadruple it to 70%, which is remarkable. 70% of, of children going on to survive for five years versus 20. That is a remarkable achievement. And that's the essence of immunotherapy of IO. That's the power of it. It's having the bravery to actually take the reins off something that you were trained, always trained to fear. And that's the challenge. And we really are witnessing a revolution today. Um, and it's all driven by this fear that's been instilled into people and let, letting go of that fear. And that's the challenge that we face but it's the same challenge that Dick Fosbury faced. You know? um, he had the courage to challenge the accepted certainty that he was never going to be any good. But he did, and he did what was true to him. And if we follow that truth as well today, um, then I believe that we are really on the cusp of a revolution. And I think it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that this could be as amazing um, as, it, as it could be, and it has the potential to be.